It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? I have always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you. So. Let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, we might as well say, Would you be mine? Would you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please? Please won't you be my neighbor?
It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Oh, I've wanted, always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you, so let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, we might as well say, would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please? Please won't you be my neighbor? We had to try that again last week. Our sound didn't work. Hopefully it's working this time. Hello, neighbor. How are you today? Hopefully you're doing OK in this global pandemic. Did you know that on April 14th, Back in 1865, something terrible happened. April 14th, 1865. You know what it was? Abraham Lincoln got shot. Now, he didn't die on the 14th. He died on the 15th, next day in the morning. It's a terrible, terrible thing. John Wilkes Booth in the theater shot the president. And then um, in 1912, a very famous ship, the unsinkable Titanic, struck an iceberg on April 14th. 1912. Terrible. Then in 1979, my poor mom was in the travails of labor forever until I finally made my screaming debut on this terrestrial ball, 1979. What's my point? My point is often grief and joy are commingled in this existence. And here we are, trying to have normal in the midst of very trying, trying circumstances. So I'm having my birthday today. And I, you know, I have sort of a, an ambivalent relationship with birthdays. I think birthdays can sort of be like your day once a year to be like super selfish and have everything sort of revolve around you. And I, I reject that. I don't like that at all. But as I've grown up and grown older, I've noticed that Birthdays are actually important for the people around you, not so much for you. And so one of our elders, Bob Hodge, he has this tradition of you know, taking his friends out for his birthday. And I love that, because it's better to give than to receive. So today, somehow, word got out uh, way before now that it was my birthday. And Jerry Kramer, also one of our elders, said maybe we could have a party at 7. So welcome, welcome, to, welcome to my birthday party. I'll share some of the things from my day, and maybe that will bring a smile to your face. If you're sad and you don't feel like partying today, that's okay. You don't, you don't have to participate, but I'll just show you some, some of the um, some birthday things here. Um, today, uh, one of the fun surprises after lunch, there uh, was a secret knocker at our door, and I had a gift bag with birthday hats from my nephew. He made the king hat and my niece who made the queen hat. So you, you can have this hat, and I'll, I'll wear this hat. They, had, they put big 41 on the front, so now you, know, you might know how old I was if you didn't already do the math from 1979 to 2012. So there's my birthday hat. Oh, and by the way, this is the point in our, our, our time together where I do the Mo Willems. Remember last week we talked about Mo Willems helping us through the pandemic by having lunchtime doodles. You can look that up on Google. He teaches children how to draw, and he's super kind and nice. And so he, he when he's telling people to collect their stuff, he will actually tell them, uh, he'll pause the video. So here I'm, I'm pausing the video, because you need your snacks. If you don't have your snacks, go get your snacks. And don't forget your Bible. You need a Bible, also a notebook or a piece of paper to write with, uh, and something to write with, rather. So we're on pause so that I can eat my birthday cake. Uh, what's your favorite birthday cake? Do you have a favorite birthday cake? My favorite birthday cake is red velvet, but I couldn't get red velvet, so I just made chocolate. But I put the, the cream cheese frosting on this. Uh, don't be very impressed. I, I'm not much of a baker. I made this uh, with the help of, you know, Pillsbury and... 
Duncan Hines or something. So I'm going to eat. Your, the video's paused anyways. You can get your stuff. Mmm, that's good. Now, last week, I told you that my DTS professor said, if you want to know the definition of sacrilege, it's to drink anything except milk with chocolate chip cookies. I'll relax on that a little bit. You can have milk with cake. It's all right. Uh, tonight, actually, what I have is black coffee with cake. I like how that pairs, so you can get whatever you want. It's fine, but mm, delicious. I have one here for you, too, so try and enjoy it, okay? Mm, mm, delicious. Oh, you got me a present. You really shouldn't have. I appreciate that. I wonder what's in there. Wait, we'll let you guys get your stuff, and then I'll open the, open the present. I don't know. Who knows what it is? Mm. Any fans of Red Velvet? No? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Tonight, Deidre made me a Texas sheet cake. It was delicious. I really like Texas sheet cake, too. Mmm, chocolate. So delicious. Okay. Get a little coffee going. Praise the Lord. Now, should we play? All right. Play? Good. What's in the bag? <gasps> I got a four pack. I got a four pack right here of, I th I'm pretty sure this is the good stuff. The Charmin. Or whatever the squeezable one is. It says Charmin. So, thank you. My household thanks you. It's starting to get rough out there, folks. Hopefully you can find your, your TP. Um, we'll just set that there, and I'll take off my lovely crown. Thank you. Appreciate that. Hopefully you enjoyed our little birthday party. Um, really, I'm, this is one of the most exciting birthday parties I've ever had because I've never had the thrill of teaching church history for my birthday party. So cheers to y'all. We're going to dig into Athanasius. Hopefully you got your snacks on board. And you realize the reason why we're dressed like this, the reason why we're cozy like this, um, is because church history can be intimidating. And we need, to, we need to cozy it up and make it warm and inviting. And so that's, that's my goal. That's, that's what's happening right now. So hopefully you're leaning in. Um, you're going to notice that tonight it, it gets a little hard at points. And the nice thing about this video stuff is that you can pause it. You can take a break. You can come back and watch tomorrow if you want. No problem. So tonight we're going to go through three chapters, roughly, of Athanasius on the Incarnation. If you weren't with us last week, that's okay. Um, I'll do a little bit of review. Last week we talked about Athanasius. He lived back um, in the 4th century mostly. His major contribution is for Trinitarian theology, teaching Trinitarian theology, and pushing against non-Trinitarian Heresies. So that's his major contribution. He also wrote this gem. It's not very long. It's only about 80-some pages um, on the Incarnation, where he is describing and theologizing and working his way through biblical passages, uh, teaching us about what the Lord did for us for our salvation in becoming human. So it's tremendous. I thought it would be a good choice uh, during this sort of Easter season, and so it's been, it has been uh, encouraging to me going through uh, a very different Easter than what we're nor used to from our normal, and I've been uh, appreciative of that. We also made a connection to C.S. Lewis last week because he, in some versions of this, you, the introduction is by C.S. Lewis, and he, in there, challenges people to read the dead guys. So his challenge, he throws it out there, he's saying, for every book you read that of a living author, try to read someone that's uh, passed away because that helps you get wisdom for the current age. So um, talked a little bit about that last week. You can check it out if you want. Uh, we also noted that Athanasius was repeatedly exiled from his bishop's seat in Alexandria because of political problems in the, in the empire. And so he knows, what it, he knows what it was like, and he flourished in spite of massive interruptions. So that was one of the points that we made at the end of last week uh, that's relevant to us now because we are trying to figure out how to flourish amid a massive interruption. 
And then uh, the teaching last week, uh, Athanasius' main point was to say, if you want to understand the incarnation, what you need to do is first begin in the beginning. And he talks about how important the creation narrative is and the fall story is to the incarnation, the salvation story. Because if you don't understand what the good beginning was like and how massive the problem of the fall is, then you, can't, you really can't deeply appreciate the magnitude of, of the solution. So if you think about, you know, what do you need for a paper cut on your hand? Well, you might not even need a Band-Aid, right? Small, small cure for a small problem. But if you have a massive health concern, then you need more radical interventions. And so the way to understand the fullness of the gospel actually is to take, even though we don't want to do this, is take a good hard look at what the Bible teaches us about the human condition in our fallenness. And so last week, Athanasius took us down, 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 down. And so this week, we can begin coming back up, 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 up. So I look forward to sharing that with you. Okay. Before we start on his content, I'd like to do just some intro on remembering how Athanasius is using some of his words. So if you've got your paper with me, I'm going to uh, do the Mo Willems thing and draw some stuff for you to, to think about. Uh, one thing I want to do is uh, remind us what, what, who, what are we as humans? What does it mean to be human? And if I write on my, on my paper on this side, being, this, see, being, Clyde, are we zoomed in close enough to see that? Looks good. Being and doing. Being and doing. Okay? So let's work on this side a little bit. Let's talk about what are human beings? What are they? Well, if you study Christian theology, you study the Bible and what theologians have taught us about humans, uh, we learn that humans are created in the image of God, which is going to be an important term that we're going to be talking about tonight, image of God, but that we're uniquely created in the image of God. We have two components that are intervolved. When I was in seminary, our professor to teach this had us all play with Play-Doh. You never think that you would play with Play-Doh in master's classes, but we did. I got my Play-Doh, and my buddy had his Play-Doh, different colors. We roll out our Play-Doh. He says, roll out your Play-Doh. Make the, the classic worm out of your Play-Doh or a snake out of your Play-Doh. Make two of them. Okay, we're making two of our Play-Doh snakes. Now trade one with your partner who has a different color, so we're trading. He's like, okay, now I want you to take your two different colors and twist them together like this. I know I didn't tell you to get Play-Doh. You could do this if you wanted to later. Twist them together like this, and now roll it so you can't get it apart anymore. And he said, what human beings are, when we study scriptures, when we study Christian theology, that we are body and soul composites. So if you think about your, your body and your soul being together, but you can't really Really tell where they start and stop. They're, they're intermingled. They're intervolved in a, in a holy mystery. That's what the Bible teaches us that we are. We're created out of material matter, out of the, the ground, it says, and then we're breathed into the breath of life by God, and we are living beings, human beings, and I'm going to write on, my, on this side of the paper, on the being side, body and soul. Okay, human beings, body and soul, okay, body and soul, great. So when we talk about being then uh, what happens in the fall and what happens when we listen to the serpent and become sinners, it's very important for us to think about what the term sin means and what the term death means because God tells the humans, if you eat the fruit of the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. So we'll come back to doing, but now you need to know what die means. Death. Death. You see that? Good. Mo Willems can draw upside down and even write upside down. He's that good, but I got a lot of practice to do that. So death. Two types of death, theologians tell us. First of all, you need to think about death as separation. OK? 
Okay? Death is separation. And the Bible promises two, God promises two types of separation, two types of death, if the humans do indeed rebel. One is spiritual death. And what we're going to say about spiritual death is separation from humans and God. Okay? Separation between humans and God. Okay, here's my shorthand. Can you see that? Separation is the S between humans and God. Separation between humans and God. Okay? Second type of death, two, is physical death. Death physical. And this is the rending or the tearing apart of your soul from your body. It is a terrible disaster for humans to come apart like that. Okay, we were, we're never supposed to come apart like that. That, that we should like, be taken out of the ground to rule over the ground in the image of God, rulers of the earth, to go back underneath it and be ruled over it by death is uh, a result of the fall, very devastating. So we need to talk about what death is. We talk about separation between God, and we also talk about physical death, which is separation, separation between body and soul. Okay, you might want to actually write them out. I'm trying to do that for you. Separation between body and soul. So what, is it, what does it mean? What does it mean to be a sinner? Now, when we talk about sin, it's really easy, it's really easy to think about sin simply as the bad deeds that we commit, or maybe extended into our thoughts, the, the um, maybe lustful thoughts or wicked thoughts that we have toward, toward other people, that we tend to think about sin in the category of action. Now, most certainly, the, the scriptures totally gives us all kinds of categories that refer to sin as categories of action. But you know what's really interesting? The Bible also teaches us that we're not that sin isn't just over here in the doing categories of things we do, actions, thoughts, etc. But that sin actually comes over here into the being, into our being. And so it's not just that that humans in their fallenness do sin, though we certainly do a lot of sin, but we actually are fundamentally in our fallenness even born into a state of sin. That means that our body and our soul have have, um, a state of sin in them. It's, It's not enough to just say, I sinned. You actually have to admit, I am a sinner. My amness, my being is contaminated with rebellion. Now, Athanasius. What's all that have to do with Athanasius? Athanasius is going to use the word corruption, the word corruption, to refer to that aspect of our contamination. We may refer to it as fallenness. Maybe you've heard it talked about as depravity, some sort of bent. There's all kinds of words theologians use to talk talk about not just the the doings that we do, but the beings that we are, that we are sinners and that we, we have this corruption. Now, it's interesting that he uses the word corruption because I think if I asked you at home, what's the first thing you think of if I say corrupt? I think a lot of us probably immediately think of maybe corrupt politicians or uh, corrupt uh, uh, people who you know, do, do wrong things that they're corrupt somehow. And that, that certainly is, is what is, he's talking about, but he's got even a broader idea of what corruption is. Corruption in this sense is referring to decay. It is referring to not being and doing as we ought to have been. That if if some some of you guys know this about me, but our family has this old wood burning stove in our house, which means that for part of the year I collect firewood, and then in the cold part of the year we burn the firewood in our wood burning stove. Well, occasionally, by the way, I keep my wood pile far away from my house for this reason. Occasionally, um, I find termites in the wood pile. And I'd never experienced this before, before I started like burning wood. I'd never been around like dry rot or termite damage until I had seen a piece of firewood now in my, in my um, 
pile that had been eaten through by termites. And it's so interesting how the, this, this piece of wood, this piece of firewood that used to be so strong and dense, and if you think about it, even supporting massive weight, the weight of a tree, now being able to like push your finger through it or just, or just touch it and for, for it to just sort of crumble away. And, and, and when I think about corruption, I think about dry rot that, that has been caused by termites in a piece of wood, that it no longer has structural integrity. It no longer is doing or being what it should have been before. And so when, when Athanasius, if you're reading through Athanasius and you keep him, he keeps coming up on corruption, humans are in corruption, they're falling back into corruption, they're being unmade. If you want to just think about that image of, of, of termites destroying the integrity of something, that's what I would recommend to you. And then on the flip side, when we talk about the Savior, um, how he's incorruptible. That is so, so amazing. So um, let's start working our way through the chapters. I need to get through three chapters tonight or so. That's what I prepared at least. We'll see how it goes. Um, so, got your Bibles, got your paper. We're going to talk about uh, chapter two, if you have a copy of the book, is entitled, at least in this edition, the Divine Dilemma and its Solution in the Incarnation. Let me say that again. The Divine Dilemma and its Solution in the Incarnation. Lots of jargon there. Let's talk about the word dilemma first. What's a dilemma? A dilemma is, is usually when you're, you have two problems presenting at the same time or two different sides of a problem that are really, really hard to solve. Sometimes the, people will refer to on the first horn of the dilemma and they lay out the first side of the dilemma. Or the, and on the second horn of the dilemma, you have these problems. And, and so what, what, what Athanasius is saying is that God's got a serious problem. He has a dilemma on his hands. There is a divine dilemma because he created these beautiful, creatures in his image. That means that they're supposed to reflect his attributes and his glory. And then this snake comes into the garden and, and does a coup and disrupts this. And so this death has occurred and their image bearing has been smudged. It's still there. But it's subject now to decay, subject to corruption. Now, this is a serious problem because the whole reason why the, the divine being, why God himself wants human beings to represent him is because of these attributes. Now, if there are those attributes, the goodness, the love, the glory even that we have as, as humans, if that's, all, if that's all like going the other way and is actually communicating instead of reflecting goodness is reflecting badness, or instead of reflecting love, is reflecting hate. You can see, Athanasius argues, that, that that's really a problem for God. His, his emissaries that are supposed to be out there doing things in his name are failing. And they're actually doing the exact opposite of what they should be doing. So the reputation of God is, is part of this is, is, is one of the, the dilemma. Okay, uh, Let me kind of give you the way he, Athanasius, uh, sets it up here. Humans now are in the process of destruction. The image of God was disappearing. The work of God was being undone. The dilemma? It would, of course, have been unthinkable that God should go back on his word. Remember, he promised, on the day you eat of it, you shall surely die, separated from me, separated from each other, separated from your, eventually your body from your soul. You shall surely die. It's unthinkable that God, can't keep, that God won't keep his word. Is God a liar? No. He must keep his word. It's unthinkable that God should go back on his word and that man, having done this, should not die. But it's equally monstrous Good word, Athanasius. It's equally monstrous that beings, humans, that had once shared the nature of God should perish and turn back into non-existence through corruption. God has to keep his word, but he can't let the, let the enemies win. He can't let his, the, us perish in destruction. Surely he can't let death win. Athanasius says, it would have been better if the humans had never been made at all. So he asks the question, well, just 
repentance be enough? Couldn't, couldn't Adam and Eve just say, hey, you know, we're sorry? And then God said, yeah, you know what, it's cool. Um, would, wouldn't repentance have been enough? And, he, and Athanasius says, yeah, maybe repentance would have been enough if, if the problem was of the trespass only, the doing of something wrong. Maybe the, the restitution could be made, repentance could be, could be made. But the problem is, it's much greater than that, 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 that sin and rebellion and corruption has now affected the being side too. So humans can't just say, sorry, because now they are sinners in their nature. Huge problem. Repentance isn't going to be enough. So he asks the question, what, or rather who, was it that was needed for such grace and such recall as we required? Who, save the word of God himself. Remember last week we said when Athanasius is talking about the word of God, he's not talking about so much about the Bible, though the word of God applies to the Bible. He's talking about the word of God. And like in John chapter 1, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It refers to Jesus Christ, the second person of the Holy Trinity, the Son of God. Right. So when he says word himself, who except the, the word of God himself who was also in the beginning and made th all things out of nothing, for he alone, being word of the Father, and above all things, was in consequence then able to recreate all and worthy to suffer on behalf of all and to be an ambassador for all with the Father. So remember, he's connecting this to creation. Who's going to fix this? Humans are being unmade. Oh, we know. The one who made us in the first place you got to get the maker back in here. He's the one that's got to remake. Because it's not just enough to say, we're sorry or have repentance. We have to literally be remade. Then, I have a passage that I want to read to you because it's just so beautiful. Athanasius is quite the writer. And I wonder what it would like to be, be like to hear him preach. Because the, the, this particular passage uh, uh, pushes along like a crescendo in a sermon. Okay? He likes the, refre the repeated phrase, he saw. He saw. He saw, he's referring to Jesus. Jesus saw these problems, okay? So just think about that. Jesus sees what's happening on the divine drama in the, in the rebellion, in the fall. And these are the things that he saw. I'm going to read to you. Ready? Read to you. He saw that the reasonable race, that as human beings that have been given mind and soul, that the reasonable race, the race of humans that, like himself, expressed the Father's mind, he saw them wasting out of existence and death reigning over them in corruption. He saw that corruption held us all the closer because it was the penalty for the transgression. He saw, too, how unthinkable it would be for the law of God to be repealed before it was fulfilled. He saw how unseemingly it was that the very things of which he himself, as the maker of the world, that those things should be disappearing. He saw how surpassing the wickedness of men was mounting up against them. They're piling up their, their sins in this, in this horrible pile. He saw also their universal liability to death. All this he saw and pitying our race, moved with compassion for our limitation. That we are unable to endure, that he was unable to endure that death should win, that should have mastery over us rather than that his creatures should perish and the work of his father for men come to nothing, he, that is Jesus, took to himself a body, a human body, even as our own. He surrendered his body to death instead of all and offered it to the father. This he did out of sheer love for us so that in his death all might die. And that the law of death, therefore, would be abolished forever. Because having fulfilled in his body that for which it was appointed, it was thereafter voided of his power for men. That is, death has no power over us. This he did, that he might turn again to incorruption men who had turned back to corruption. You hear that, that recreation, turning back from corru corruption, remaking us? And make them alive through death by the appropriation of his body and by the grace of his resurrection. Thus, he would make death disappear from them as utterly as straw from fire. 
It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Continues, he starts to talk. He's setting up how the solution is going to come through Christ. Talks about how he is going to, um, that death, a death is going to be necessary to kill death. Uh, but he's going to make us alive through resurrection. Death has to do it. But since God the Son can't die, he's God. He's pure life himself. He must assume a nature that, is, that can die. He must take on a human nature that has the possibility of mortality. He's going to offer himself as a substitutionary sacrifice. Again, big words. What does that mean? Uh, he, he in our place, a substitute. He offered his own temple and bodily instrument as a substitute for the life of all, says Athanasius. He, how can he do this for all of mankind? And he offers an illustration. He says, like a great king that dwells in a city and brings honor to the entire city and enemies and robbers cease to come after it. So, so Christ can do this for all, the Bible tells us as a great king can bring honor and protection to an entire city or an entire country. So this chapter, Athanasius will end, and you've been wondering where the Bible passages are. Here they come. He actually ends the chapter by stacking passages. I love that. So he's kind of like getting you ready for the text, and then he plunges in near the end. So if you have your Bibles with you, or if you'd just like to jot these down, we probably don't have, it's probably going to go a little bit too fast to turn to them. So I'm going to turn to the main one, which is um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. By the way, that's just a good chapter to sort of, in, in your mind, know. It, it's good as you're trying to like lay out the Bible in your mind to know where certain big things are, right? Like, where are the Ten Commandments? Deuteronomy 5 and Exodus 20. You know, where is this word became flesh passage? John 1. Where, you know, where are the major Romans road passages? It's good to kind of have those laid out. When you were thinking about death and resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15 is your go-to passage. All of you should ask to have it read, at least part of it, in your funeral. So you're, you're talking to a pastor about what scriptures to have read. Say, pastor, make sure that somebody at some point, whether it's in the service or at the graveside, uh, Mention some verses from uh, 1 Corinthians 15. This is our great hope in the resurrection. So Athanasius is stacking biblical evidence for his argument. The first text is 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 and 15. So let me say that again. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. Here it is. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this. That one has died for all. Remember we were talking about a city, the solidarity of mankind. A king can, can uh, bring protection and uh, goodness to a, a whole group. One has died for all. And then, here it comes. Therefore, all have died. And he died for all. That those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. So he's just making, he's making biblical arguments. The second text this evening in this chapter is Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. But we see him, Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels. Namely, Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. So that, by the grace of God, here it is again, he might taste death for everyone. Verse 10, for it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist. See how the biblical writer goes right for the, the creation narrative. Who made the world? Jesus made the world. It's fitting that the creator, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder, should make the founder of their salvation Perfect through suffering. Hear that? Creator of the world, founder of salvation. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 is our next text. Hebrews 2, 14. Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, he, and we're talking about Jesus again, he himself likewise partook of the same things. That's incarnation. That, for the reason... That through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. He's going to take back his country. 
and deliver all those who, through fear of death, were subject to lifelong slavery. The fear of death makes us afraid. It controls us a lot of times. One of the massive and most important things about the gospel is that it can release us from the fear of death. It makes us super weird. It makes us super weird, but it also makes us super compelling because everybody's scared of death except us, right? Now, if you feel afraid of death sometimes, yeah, I do too. We all do. We all do. So it doesn't mean that we never experience an emotion of the fear of death. But it means that the gospel story and the faith that we have delivers to us a solution to death that is so transcendent that it can drive martyrs to uh, give their bodies in, in the Colosseum to wild animals, says Paul in, here we are, 1 Corinthians 15. I would love to read massive parts of this, but we need to keep going. So I'm just going to read for now verse 21. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 21. For as by a man came death, he's referring there to Adam, by a man also has come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. So, we did it. Let's go to chapter 3. Chapter 3 is a continuation of chapter 2. In fact, the title of the chapter is the same. The Divine Dilemma and its Solution in the Incarnation Continued. Oh, very clever. It's continued. Part part 2, okay? Athanasius continues to articulate the problem of the fall. Now he's going to talk about it in terms of lost knowledge of God. And he's going to argue that it's an essential part of being an image bearer that you know that you are an image bearer, right? So what's the point of making human beings image bearers of God if they don't know that they are? They're no different than than animals or other, other beings that aren't moral agents made in the image of God. If we don't have knowledge that we're made in the image of God, there's really no point. Right? I was thinking today of, I didn't bring the props in to show you, but if I had a reflector, like you know the kind that are on your bicycles that really shine like crazy bright, especially in the darkness when the, the, your headlights hit them just right. It's amazing how bright they get. Right? Imagine you had you know headlight or sorry reflectors that had no idea we're going to personify them a little bit that they were supposed to be reflectors. And they were doing all their, their things, but they weren't reflecting. And they had no idea that they were supposed to be reflectors. Um, how, would that, how would that go? Would they be where they were supposed to be doing the things they're supposed to do so that when the bright light shines on them, they light up? So if we're not very good reflectors, there's a problem with the glory. If, so it's, it's, important, it's important that we know that we are image bearers. If that's lost, that becomes a serious problem for us because it essentially, and I said this just a minute ago, essentially makes us no different than animals. And it represents a massive loss of our only true happiness because the Bible puts forth the only blessed life, the only truly richly flourishing life is the life where a, a human being is, is reflecting God well and doing their, um, where at, that image bearing is restored. But it's also a problem for God this problem of lost knowledge of God, because it's his image that's on the line, his reputation that's being distorted. So he's saying if, if image bearers are losing the knowledge of God, that's a problem for humans because it's going to make him terribly unhappy. And it's a problem for God because it's his reputation that is being destroyed by this problem. But it's worse than that. I'm sorry. I'm a bearer of bad news. That's why we wear the Mr. Rogers cardigan, because it's worse than you thought. It's worse than a mere loss of knowledge. The divine image in humans through sin is actually defiled. So, and then he's going to just take us briefly on a tour. For example, in idolatry, you've got humans transferring the honor that belongs to God alone onto lifeless objects. How profane is it to wor- for humans to worship things they made when God alone is the maker who deserves the honor of being called the maker? 
You see, if, if humans are doing idolatry, they're, they're defacing that. They're, they're defiling that. Humans also worship demons. And they invent very expensive and demanding false religions. And therefore, they stoop lower and lower, bringing themselves more and more under the insane control of demons and false religions. When we have missionary updates uh, and missionaries come, they tell us about the sadness of, 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 of whole cultures that are trapped in, in very uh, superstitious, animistic religions. How, how scared they are all the time of things that you and I never dream about being afraid of. And they're trapped by that, enslaved by that. Athanasius calls that, it calls that insane control and a very, very dehumanizing thing. He mentions magic arts, he, ma he, he mentions divination, and he talks about astrology, all of these things leading men astray by attributing false causes and false credit onto things that, don't, that are not providence, that are not God, and they're getting all the credit for it. So this loss of the knowledge of God, to give, to give the glory of God to the stars, is terribly dehumanizing. Being made in God's image in itself is sufficient to deliver knowledge of God to human beings. What does that mean? He's saying being made in God's image is enough to communicate an awful lot about God to each other. It probably would have been enough. But God, knowing our weakness, gave us even more revelation. And he's going to give us three now. One, nature. Right? You guys know Romans 1 talks about how you can look up at the moon and the stars and see the order of creation and think, huh. Some, somebody pretty powerful made this. Some great mind really put a lot of complicated stuff together. That's amazing. So humans should be able to look at nature and learn something about God, but there's, there's more. The prophets. God gives, gives revelation to holy men. He said you, you could you know, talk, to, talk to prophets at different times and different places and, and learn knowledge about God, revelation. And besides the prophets, then you have these prophecies that are written down and, and inscripturated, and so you get the law. So besides the, the fact of our own humanness going around in the world being able to communicate the image of God, we also have nature that's able to communicate the knowledge of God. We also have the law and the prophets that are able to commun communicate the knowledge of God. But Athanasius is going to stack questions now of, to press this dilemma home. And I love this because, again, we're back to the preacher Athanasius. The stacking of questions is very powerful. What was God to do? He repeats himself twice. What was God to do in the face of this dehumanizing of mankind, this universal hiding of the knowledge of himself by demons and evil spirits who are obscuring it? What's he going to do? Was he to keep silence? Just let it happen? Was he to keep silence before so great a wrong and let men go on being thus deceived and in ignorance of, his, of, his, of himself? If, he, if so, if he's supposed to just be quiet, then what was the use of him having made us in the first place in his own image? It surely would have been better for us to, than to just be animals rather than to revert to that condition once they had once shared the image of God. Better to be animals, more faithful less idolatrous. What's God going to do? What possible prophet could it be to God himself who made men if when he made them, they didn't worship him but regarded other stuff as their makers? This would be tantamount to him having made them for others and not himself. Here Athanasius illustrates that it, the point that it would be crazy, it would be crazy for an earthly king to let his lands be conquered and fall into ruin. Is it not right that those who had once shared, it is not right that those who had shared his image that they should be destroyed? This is the dilemma. And then he's going to repeat the question again. What then was God to do? <laughs> what else could he possibly do being God but renew his image in mankind? So that through it, men might once more come to know him. And how could this be done? And how could that be done? Except by the coming of the Son of God himself. The coming of the very image himself, our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Men could not have done it, for they're made after the image. Angels couldn't have done it, for they don't have the image of God. The word of God, the perfect image of the unseen God, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came in his own person because it was he alone who was the image of the Father who could recreate the image after this terrible loss. So in order for him to do this, he first has to do away with the problem of death and corruption. Remember, we have this, this, that sin isn't just on the doing side, it's on the being side. And so he has to do away with this problem that we, that we are sinners, that we are sinners. We need, we need, a, our amness is so bad, we need a new am to come in and be am for us. So now, once again, scriptural support. Scriptural support that Jesus is on a recreation mission. Athanasius Athanasius likes to cite repetitively Luke 19.10 where Jesus says this, I came to seek and to save that which is lost. And Athanasius is thinking about that more than just lost lammies that you're bringing back into the fold, which is a beautiful image, one of my favorite ones. But Jesus is on a recreation mission. What was lost? The image of God and man. I came to seek and save Humans, recreate the image of God in humans to seek, and, to, to seek and to save that which is lost. Luke 19, 10. He says, but that's only part of the son's mission. He, Jesus also came as a teacher. So we need to talk for a few minutes about the teaching ministry of Christ. So if the madness of idolatry and irreligion is running rampant throughout the world, whose job is it, Athanasius asked, whose job was it to teach us about the Father? Man certainly couldn't do it very well, had centuries to prove that. Even the best men were blinded by evil. Nature or creation was there, but that didn't stop men from wallowing in error. He'll keep talking about how men refuse to look up and think about God. They would rather look down and wallow in error. And you can't help but think about the C.S. Lewis uh, imagery where he talks about we don't, we don't desire enough. The problem with us is that we can't lift our heads. We, we can't imagine a, a holiday at the sea. We're too busy making mud pies, right? Wallowing in the mud. Creation was there, but men were too busy wallowing in error. Men had neglected to consider the heavens before, and now they're looking in the opposite direction. They're looking down. Wherefore, in all naturalness and fitness, desiring to do good to men as man he dwells, taking to himself a body like the rest, and through his actions done in that body, as it were on their own level, he teaches those who would not learn by other means to know himself, the word of God, and through him the Father. So, We talked about how God reveals himself to us through the image that we carry, through nature, through the law and the prophets. Now Athanasius is saying we got something even better. We got something better than nature. We got something better than the law and the prophets. We got the son of man. We have the son of God in the flesh. And he's going to teach us, like, we're looking down. Guess what? He's going to come down and be like, hello. Here I am. And he stoops. He comes all the way down into the mud to teach us. And he goes on to this, this, this uh, how does his teaching ministry work? He goes on to talk about that. As a good teacher, he comes down to our level. He meets us at the level of our senses by becoming an object for our senses so that those who are seeking God in sensible things, like idols, They now may may learn to know about the Father through the works of Jesus and the word of Jesus, the things he did. I've got a fabulous quote for you. Hopefully you're hanging in there. Remember, you can pause it. You can come back tomorrow. It's fine. Were humans awe-stricken by creation? They beheld it confessing Christ as Lord. So this is really cool because he's like, okay, you can sort of look up at nature and uh, learn something about God, guess what happens with Jesus? Creation confesses Christ as Lord. Remember? He stills the water, and they're like, whoa, who's this? The wind and the waves obey him. Right? So he's Lord of creation. Did their minds tend to regard men as gods? Do we, do we worship and idolize other, other important rich people or famous politicians? Do we idolize them? 
The uniqueness of the Savior's works marked him alone of all men as the Son of God and worthy of worship. Were humans drawn to evil spirits? Of course they are. What do they see in the teaching ministry of Christ? They see those evil spirits driven out by the Lord and learn that the word of God alone was God and that the evil spirits were not gods at all. Look at them. And the pigs running down the hill and drowning in the water. Amazing. Were they, the humans, inclined, inclined to hero worship and cult of the dead, worshiping the dead? Then the fact that the Savior had risen from the dead and shown them how false these other deities were and that the word of the Father is the one true Lord, the Lord even of death. For this reason, he became human. And for this reason, died and rose in order that, eclipsing by his works all other human deeds, he might recall men from the paths of their errors to know the Father the recovery of the knowledge of the Father. It's Jesus' teaching ministry in his words and in his works. As he says himself, I came to seek and to save that which is lost. Really beautiful repetition of the Luke passage. Next, he's going to quote, he's going to quote from Ephesians 3, 17 and 19. Let me say that again. Ephesians 3, 17 through 19. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So he's going to see, notice the, the, um, the knowledge of God, right? The self-revealing of the word this is Athanasius now saying, the self-revealing of the word is in every dimension. Did you catch it in the text? He's above in creation. He's below in the incarnation. He's in the depth in Hades, in the breadth throughout the world. Really lovely interpretation of that passage where he's sort of taking the dimensions of the passage and saying, look, Jesus is Lord everywhere, everywhere. All things have been filled with the knowledge of God. This teaching ministry is so important it's why he didn't immediately offer himself to be sacrificed. It's an interesting question. Have you ever wondered why it wouldn't have been, a, wouldn't have been enough for, just, D, just for the baby Jesus to have died when Herod tried to kill all the babies and be the savior of the world as a kid? I mean, that's kind of a strange question. That's why we read the dead guys, because they're asking weird questions that we've never thought of. But think about that. It's worth thinking about. The teaching ministry of Christ is crucial. We need that. It's super important. And so he did that for us in his incarnation, in his condescension, and in his becoming our teacher before he becomes the sacrifice. So beautiful. Next, he goes on to uh, answer some theological questions. You know, people have wondered, is it a problem that the Lord of the universe, the omnipresent one, is now a baby localized? You know, is there a problem that the omnipotent creator of the universe now uh, doesn't know or does, can't uh, walk? Is it a problem that the omniscient one who should know all things doesn't know how to talk? So the, he's going to just briefly touch on how the incarnation represents no problem for the attributes of the divine and the human coming together and forming a unity. And we don't have, we don't, that's a super inter interesting question to you and to me. We don't have enough time to really delve into that right now. I do that in other places. If you email me, I can send you uh, to interesting texts to talk about how um, in the incarnation, the divine and the human are united in really miraculous and wonderful ways. And, and he just briefly talks a little bit about that. So we're ready for chapter four. You hanging in there? I'm about to eat that cupcake just to go for another round. This is the last one. You're doing great. You're doing great. I'm so proud of you. Chapter 4 is entitled The Death of Christ. Chapter 4 is The Death of Christ. As Athanasius has argued that the life of our Lord was critical to teaching us. Remember, we were just talking about the teaching us the knowledge of, of God the Father by word and deed. Now he's going to focus our attention on the death of Christ. Super important, right? We just came through Good Friday. It's focused on the death of Christ. He opens the chapter with some really beautiful lines saying this, even very creation broke silence at his command, and it's quite marvelous to relate to you, confessed, creation confessed with one voice before the cross, that monument of victory, 
that he who suffered thereon in the body was not man only, but son of God and savior of all. So how did creation confess that Jesus was Lord at the crucifixion? You know the story. Here it comes. The sun veiled his face. Remember the darkness? The earth quaked. The mountains were rent asunder. All men stricken with awe. These things showed that Christ on the cross was God and that all creation was his slave and was bearing witness by its fear to the presence of its master. Wow. 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 Besides all that Jesus teach us or Jesus teaches us humans still owe a debt of a debt a debt of death that has to be paid. So we love the teaching ministry of Christ, but there's another problem, the death problem, the corruption problem. All men owe death. Here then is the second reason why the word dwelt among us, namely that having proved his Godhead by his works and his ministry, now he may offer the sacrifice on behalf of all, surrendering his own temple, his body and soul, to death in place of all, to settle man's account with death and free him from the primal transgression. In that same act, death, he also showed himself mightier than death, displaying his own body incorruptible as the first fruits of the resurrection. So we get a chapter on the death, and then chapter, chapter 5 will be on the resurrection. Remember that the Lord's body is a real human body. He has a body and soul, a human body and soul, not subject to, to corruption. He's going to argue that it was capable of dying, but because his humanness was, was united to the divine, he was capable of dying for all of us and thereby abolishing death and corruption. This, of course, brings the devil to nothing and releases believers from the slavery of the fear of death. So he then exhorts the readers, readers, have no fears. And he quotes from 1 Corinthians 15 again, where it says this, for this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come this mocking sentence where we mock death. It goes like this. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? You can only talk like that if you're united to the conqueror of death. Now Athanasius sets out to answer this question. Why did our Savior have to die in such a public, shameful death? When, is that really becoming of the Lord of the universe? Why does it have to be so like, public and so bad and so nasty? Oh, thanks. Glad you asked. First, he wants to us to know is to show us that he was unfallen. Now, this is a little bit complicated, but he says this. Since, since Jesus wasn't a sinner, you've got to think about his body and soul being more like Adam and Eve's before the fall. Since, his body is, is, um, since he wasn't a sinner, his body wasn't subject to sickness, it would never wear out and die like our bodies do. Though it could die, he had to be killed by someone in order to die. So that's his, his answer. We could talk more about that. I don't have enough time to delve into that. But why does it need to be so, so public and so shameful? Athanasius argues that if Christ had died quietly, if somebody killed him in his bed in a real private manner, then no one would have believed that his humanness was, in fact, unfallen. He had to be murdered, and he had to be murdered publicly. Lots of witnesses. So the nature, the public nature of this death then gives powerful testimony to his public resurrection. I know everybody wasn't there when he literally came up, but he was seen by everybody as a resurrected Lord, touched, eaten with, right? So the public nature of his death then gives powerful testimony to his resurrection. There was no private tale of a secret death and a secret resurrection. No, you have lots of proof, lots of witnesses and for subsequent generations, the whole story is easier, easier to believe because of the massive body of witnesses that were able to testify to it. It's a pretty distinctive feature of Christianity. A lot of the other religions have like one guy was alone in the woods, and he got secret revelation from a special person. Nobody knew about it, and he came back and said, listen to me, I heard from somebody. I'm like, oh, we believe you. Christianity is way different. It's not a, a secret thing in a secret place. It's real public. This part's real, real public. Lots of witnesses. So 
Uh, why, why, Athanasius asked, couldn't he have had a more honorable death? Wouldn't it have been better for, for Jesus to have a more honorable death? He says, actually, Athanasius says to show he has, a, he has the power in this horrible death to show that he has the power over all types of death, even the most shameful deaths. And he illustrates this with a champion wrestler. Eh, good image. I was a wrestler once. Once. This champion wrestler... He lets other people pick out his opponents, right? He, a good wrestler who's undefeated isn't just going to, like, go and pick out the weakest opponents and then beat them. He lets other people pick out their opponents. You get the, the biggest, nastiest, gnarliest guy, and if you beat him, then, he's, you know, he's a champion, right? So he's like that. Jesus is saying, he doesn't t- just take on any death. He takes on the nastiest one and shows that he's lord over all deaths, even the most shameful ones, as a champion, um, he goes on to add that he, we note that he wasn't beheaded or torn apart, and he makes this beautiful little um, move to say this. Even in death, he preserves his body whole and undivided so that there should be no excuse hereafter for those who divide the church. A creative little move. Like, why is Jesus not beheaded or torn apart? Why is he a unit? Because later we're going to be told that the church is the body of the Christ and isn't supposed to be torn apart. Interesting. But he's going to save his best answers for last. Why the nasty cross? And again, Athanasius is going to stack scripture at the end of the chapter. Number one, why the cross? Number one, to become a curse for us. To become a curse for us. Galatians 3.13 says this, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is anyone who is hanged on a tree. So he's in fulfillment of the Old Testament, this, this death, curse of death. He's taking the curse of the law on us by this horrible, horrible cross. Number two, why the cross? Now he's going to uh, reference Ephesians 2.14. Ephesians 2.14. Why the cross? To, re- to ransom everyone, calling the Gentiles as Gentiles, with his arms outstretched, calling the Jews with one hand and the Gentiles with the other. Ephesians 2.14 says this, For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Now, this is a very uh, creative interpretive move, too. Why the cross? Because the Bible tells us, all right, remember in the Old Testament, the only way to become saved if you weren't Jewish, was to become Jewish. You had to enter into the Jewish religion and then you would be saved. Now, what happens with Jesus is is that the Gentiles no longer have to become Jewish. Jews and Gentiles together become Christians and that dividing wall of needing to become Jewish, the the barrier between uh, Jews and Gentiles is, is taken away by Christ. And so what Athanasius does very creatively is saying his arms are outstretched and he's calling the Jews with one hand and the Gentiles with the other and bringing them all together into a community in his own body. Why the cross? Because you're like this, calling both peoples into one. Wow, interesting. Number three, why the cross? To defeat the devil in the air. Now, that's a strange thing. You're thinking about like some sort of death match between these guys up in the air. Or they're flying around. What does he mean? In the air? To defeat the devil in the air. And he quotes two passages. One is from John 12, 32. When Jesus is predicting the manner of his, of his death, he says, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth will draw all people to myself. So Jesus is predicting that his death will be off the earth, lifted up in the air. And then he'll connect this, Athanasius will connect this to Ephesians 2.2, 2, which says this, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following, get this, here's the important part. It's all important, what I want to highlight. The prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. The prince of the power of the air. Jesus is up in the air. Who has jurisdiction over the air? The prince of the power of the air, the devil. And then he says this. But the Lord came to overthrow the devil and to purify the air. 
and to make a way for us up to heaven. It's very uh, creative uh, language. You're thinking about maybe Jacob's ladder, a, a stairway to heaven, a, a restoration, whatever your metaphor is, that, that now Jesus is going to clear the air where the devil reigns and make a way through the air to, to heaven. Let me say this. He cleansed the air from all the evil influences of the enemy. He quotes Luke uh, 10.18, which says this. I, Jesus, beheld Satan as lightning falling out of the air. He says, and thus reopened the road to heaven, saying again, and then he's going to quote Psalm 14. Lift up your gates, O ye princes, and be lifted up, ye everlasting doors. For it was not the word, for it was not the word himself who needed an opening of the gates, he being Lord of all, nor was any of his works closed to their maker. No, it was we who needed it, who we who he himself bore in his own body, that body which he offered to death on behalf of all, and then made through it a path to heaven. So why the cross? It's in the air where the devil is. He's going to do battle with him and then make open a portal, open a gate, open a way to heaven. This is a very, very artistic, figurative uh, interpretation of, of the text. And so um, all that to like just talk about why the cross and uh, listing for you several, several different um, ways to think about that. Uh, so what are some, just some things for us to think about as I'm summing up and sort of landing the plane for this session. Um, really what I want you to remember is that the divine image has to be renewed. That, that our problem isn't just like the sins that we do, but the fact that we are sinners. And so the magnitude of the cure that we need isn't just like behavior management to make sure that I, you know, chew with my mouth closed and, you know, don't have bad thoughts. I need way more savior than just behavior modification. I need a new nature. I have to be recreated by Jesus. So if, if it's hard to feel thankful for this grace, if, if you sing amazing grace like this, Amazing grace. And you're wondering, for years, I has not felt amazing at all. I just want you to think about that for a second. We, we need him way more and are dependent on him way more than we can imagine. He's bringing a new nature for us and gives us a new nature, recreating us, the one who created everything. It's a delicious thought. It's a very worshipful thought. And I hope that it's an encouraging thought when we are struggling with certain types of fears. Second, um, the person, we like, we like to talk about the person and the work of Christ. So if you're used to thinking about Jesus, like all of Jesus' um, ministry for us as being like dying on the cross for our sins as a sacrifice, that's great. Obviously, it's huge, but that's not all of it. So I, I love the idea that he um, has this teaching ministry. And I wanted to just, you know, think about how Upland is uniquely, our church has a lot of educators in it. Uh, public school, homeschool, Christian university, just lots of, lots of people who have given their lives, their career work to um, propagating knowledge. And I, I want you to know that it is a, it is a Christian vocation to be spreading abroad the knowledge of the Father through Christ. We, we have a teaching ministry following the great teacher. So if you're, if you're a teacher, and all of us are, by the way, we're always teaching each other, but if you're specifically a teacher and you feel discouraged because you miss your students, because you want to be in the classroom like normal, that you're having to do the devices, and you're trying to like figure out how to you know, you know, engage them. I'm, I'm discouraged too. I'm discouraged too. But there's something very powerful, the idea that Jesus came to us anyways. <laughs> the teachers uh, like Jesus sort of overcome the obstacles and the interruptions and all of the difficulties and figure out some way to be like, hey, remember Jesus? The Father, right? And so I, I, I was latching on to that today as an encouraging thing. Uh, he's not only um, teaching us by his words, but his deeds. And that is tremendously, tremendously important. So five minutes left. 
I think that you drank from the fire hose. Hopefully you took some time to, you know, hit pause. You can hit pause and play. Take a bathroom break if you have to. It's a lot of material. Um, but we're in a different format, and I know that you can take breaks, so I'll just keep, keep working our way through it. Really, I'm trying to give you a commentary, so this is easier to manage because it's hard, uh, hard to deal with, so, um, but tremendously rich and vibrant. So why don't we pray for us, and we'll, we'll shut it down and say goodnight. Um, Father in heaven, we thank you so much for not leaving us to rot and decay and corruption, but for giving us the Lord Jesus, the incorruptible one. So we pray, Lord, that wherever, whatever our needs are right now, and we'll even extend that out to the needs of the country and the world, which there, there's a lot right now, that you would help us to fix our eyes, fix our gaze on the most beautiful one who has done so much for us and is continuing to do so much for us every day. Help us for, to, help us for when we feel sad, Help us to be able to find joy in the little things. Thank you for the church and so many who are trying to, to encourage one another in word and in deed during these difficult days. We thank you for the holy scriptures, which are able to make us wise and godly. But we also thank you for the saints who are long dead, who are still, who, who are still speaking to, uh, through the ages, even now, giving us wisdom and insight. We pray that you would help us to listen. But most of all, Lord, and lastly, I want to thank you for grace upon grace that I can't even fathom or imagine how, how kind you've been to us, what you're doing for us. And so we just offer just a tiny little, little bit of thanksgiving for, for that and say we love you tonight, we, we worship you, and we pray that you'd be with us in a very close way by the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Good night.